Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to our sharing on St. John's Gospel. Uh, we're now going to go into chapter three and we have the mystery uh, of the spirit is going to be revealed to Israel. And John tells us that uh, there was one of the Pharisees called Nicodemus and he was a leading Jew. That means uh, one of the Sanhedrin, he was a Judean. Uh, who came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we know. That means the Sanhedrin knew who Jesus was. We know that you are a teacher that comes from God. That makes all their opposition totally vile. We know that you are a teacher who comes from God, for no one could perform the signs that you do unless God were with him. And then Jesus answered, I tell you most solemnly, Unless a man is born from above, he cannot even enter the kingdom of God. So let's begin this uh, new discussion uh, with John's Gospel. So Jesus is going to try and get across the fact that the people of Israel have to be born again. Now, you, you need to understand that to be born uh, into the people of Israel meant that you went through a physical operation called circumcision and then you became uh, a child of the covenant. They, of course, had descent from Abraham. They were sons of God as a, as a result of the descent from Abraham. So Jesus is going to have to clear things up for them. And he's going to tell them that descent from Abraham is not actually going to be the issue in the kingdom of God because he wants to bring in all nations into the kingdom of God. And he's going to bypass the physical operation of circumcision and he wants everybody be, to be born of God. So no matter what nation you come from or what generation you live in, the new birth will be the same for everybody. Everybody will be born of God, born of water and the Spirit. That's going to be very difficult for the Sanhedrin to take on board because as far as they're concerned, it will be cancelling their religion. So. Jesus is approached by a member of the Sanhedrin um, and very often we uh, give a very negative comment about Nicodemus because he only appears at the beginning of uh, the text in John and then he appears after Jesus' death. People don't realise that Jesus actually had some friends in the Sanhedrin. But in order for the, the whole business of Israel to continue, and until uh, Jesus could bring the new kingdom into uh, reality, they had to keep their jobs uh, and they had to continue their everyday lives. Um, but they couldn't speak up in the Sanhedrin. And when the Sanhedrin became uh, very negative towards Jesus, which they did right from the beginning, men like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, two that everybody knows about, uh, they had to keep very quiet. But because they kept quiet, they were able to alert Jesus and his disciples about what was actually going on. So it's not all negative. But John wants to show it to you from a level of below because Jesus wants to raise everything to a high level. He wants to raise it to the level of above. And so when John emphasizes that he came to Jesus by night, 
Now, the ordinary meaning for that is that Nicodemus couldn't come during the day because of the uh, antipathy of the Sanhedrin. But for John, coming by night means he's coming from a very low level uh, and he's coming from the agency of darkness that will oppose Jesus. So he wants to emphasize that part of it. Uh, But I've already given you a text from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, that the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Now, darkness in this gospel means unbelief. It means being at a very worldly level. It means not understanding Jesus. And it might even mean something worse, that you're living a sinful life and therefore open to the influence of Satan in your life. Uh, So the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who live in the land of deep shadow a light has shone. So Nicodemus represents the whole leadership of the Sanhedrin. And his problems are identified with all the problems of the Sanhedrin. We're going to find when we go into chapter four that the Samaritan woman's problems are identified with the problems of her people as well. And this is a, a device that John uses to get across to us that there are very different ways in which we have to approach different people. It depends on where they come from and what their circumstances are. Um, So in order to really understand this dialogue with Nicodemus, let's go back to the the last sentence of chapter 2, the one we left just in our last episode. And it says in chapter 2 from verse 24 that Jesus knew them all. And he didn't trust himself to any of them. He never needed evidence about any man. He could tell what a man had in him. Nicodemus is at a great disadvantage because Jesus can read him like a book. And Nicodemus cannot read Jesus. He's going on the signs. And that was what the the Judeans went for all the time. And the Galileans as well, in fact. So he's at a disadvantage that he doesn't have uh, the knowledge or the wisdom that Jesus has, because Jesus' knowledge and wisdom are divine. Nicodemus represents the fact that the Sanhedrin absolutely refused to go beyond the signs to penetrate the mystery of the person of Jesus. And John has already got across to us very eloquently, in my opinion, that if you don't penetrate the, the mystery of the person of Jesus, the signs are not going to do anything for you. We know even from modern times that people can experience miracles and it doesn't increase their faith. So depending on signs is not a good thing. And at the end of the gospel, Jesus is going to say to Thomas, look, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. In other words, they have believed in Jesus himself, not just in in the works. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus full of religion. And we're going to see the great need to shift from religion to spirituality. And so Nicodemus represents a real problem that's in the church today as well, that people can have uh, an awful lot of religion and forget that the essence of religion is to have a personal relationship with God. And to have a personal relationship with God Uh, expressed in prayer and in everyday life as well. He has all the laws and the regulations and he has the knowledge and he has the books and he has the education. He has the job, he has the clothes, he has the meetings, he has the privileges. He appears to have everything. In actual fact, he has nothing. Jesus calls him in verse 9, a teacher of the law. That means that this man is a skilled person. He knows the Bible. He knows all the commentaries. He he teaches it. And yet he's going to come across to to Jesus as somebody who just doesn't get it, just doesn't understand. Um, He is not even aware of the arrogance and the self-complacency that he has when he says, we know. That means they're already talking about Jesus behind his back. They're already discussing uh, what's going on. And they've already come to conclusions. 
either for or against him, the vast majority against him. Uh, he does an amazing thing for a member of the Sanhedrin. He actually calls Jesus rabbi. That's really something. Now, those of us who are lay people and who are not uh, the children of Abraham don't appreciate that to call somebody rabbi was a, a term of real respect. And so we shouldn't look at Nicodemus too negatively, although he represents the problems of the Sanhedrin. Um, Nicodemus gives the, gives the game away completely when he says that we've already decided that you have come from God. Now, the rest of the Sanhedrin wouldn't like Nicodemus to say that. They tried to give Jesus the impression that they, they considered him a complete fake, but that wasn't so. Nicodemus says, no, we know very well you come from God. We know very well that your signs actually prove this. Uh, which means, of course, that their rejection of Jesus was entirely without excuse. Um, but Nicodemus is coming on this low level of law and religion and all the rest of it, and he's going to have to be raised up to the higher level of spirituality and entering into a personal relationship with God. So uh, he's going to find that difficult because once Jesus says to him, I tell you most solemnly, and Jesus only used that expression when he was making a very serious revelation. He said, unless a man, that means any man, not just you personally, unless a man is born from above. Now, we know, we the readers of the gospel know that back in chapter one and verse 13, we were told that those who did accept him, he would give them the privilege of becoming children of God. Now, Nicodemus is at a great disadvantage to you and me. He doesn't know that. And so uh, Jesus says, unless there is this radical, fundamental change in you, you cannot even be part of the kingdom of God. Now, for Nicodemus, that is a complete shock. It's, it's a complete no-no. This is just not on. And yet Jesus says that just to begin the conversation, okay? And so he's trying to say to Nicodemus, which Nicodemus could hear, that from here on in, it was not enough to be a child of Abraham. For the entire Old Testament period, being a child of Abraham was the most privileged thing on this planet. And all their privileges came to them by natural descent from Abraham. And so you're going to hear them saying to Jesus, we're children of Abraham. But Jesus is going to say, no, the issue from here on in is to be a child of God, is to be a son of God in the image of Jesus. And there was a huge difference. And so uh, when they really get what he's saying, they will retort in chapter 8, verse 53, are you greater than Abraham? Who do you make yourself out to be? And then he will shock them to the core of their being by saying, before Abraham ever was, I am. So Nicodemus is completely shocked even at this. And he said, listen, how can a grown man be born? So here's Nicodemus down here at this lower level. And of course, it's completely impossible for an adult to go back into their mother's womb. Uh, how can you go back into the mother's womb and be born again? Now, as far as Nicodemus is concerned, the only spiritual birth he knew was circumcision. That was going into the womb of the covenant of Moses and being born into the covenant of Moses. He, he says you can't do that a second time because the sign of the physical circumcision remained. That was it. But Jesus isn't talking about that. Uh, and Jesus doesn't a pander to any of his problems. He challenges him to rise to a higher plane and to start listening at a higher plane. And so Jesus said, I tell you most solemnly, unless a man is born through water and the spirit, therefore circumcision is gone. And yet when you come to the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the, the leaders of the church will struggle when they move out to deal with the Gentiles uh, with 
is circumcision really gone? Is water and the spirit absolutely enough? And St. Paul will be wonderful uh, in defending that. Unless a man is born through water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus is a scholar. He can hear what Jesus is saying. So he's hearing that whatever Jesus is doing, you cannot even participate at all unless you have this new birth. He hears that clearly. And he also hears that it hasn't anything to do with circumcision. He also hears it has nothing to do with being a descendant from Abraham. And Jesus uh, underlines what he's saying by saying to him, listen, what is born of flesh is flesh. Whatever is down here at this lower level, that is not spiritual. It doesn't belong to, to the, the spirit level. What is born of the spirit is spirit. So here's the difference between flesh and spirit. Now we got this the opposite way in chapter one, when the Logos became Sarx, this infinite distance between the word and flesh. And now we're being told that the flesh cannot take you into the spirit world. Only the spirit of God can take you there. And you've got to have this new birth, uh, a birth that will not come from uh, the will of man or the urge of the flesh, that each one of us will be born of God in baptism. And he said, don't be surprised at this, uh, that you must be born from above. The wind blows wherever it pleases. Now, the wind is Ruach Adonai, that is the Spirit of God. Uh, and the Spirit of God will blow wherever it wants. So Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you will be very surprised at who will accept this new life. And you will also be very surprised at who won't accept it as well. OK, we learned in chapter one, verse 12, that all who did accept him, he gave them power to become children of God, not born of human stock or urge of the flesh or will of man, but born of God. OK, so Jesus is saying uh, that, that you need a new father to beget you in the spirit. And that new father is the father in heaven, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore we can say, Avinu, our father, our father. And Jesus alone can give us this gift. The Sanhedrin are never going to accept this. Uh, they're never going to accept that Jesus uh, can do something that is completely above their authority and beyond their understanding. Uh, so they're not going to accept it. But some people will rise uh, with him to the higher plane and allow Jesus to work in them. But what John wants, because I told you at the very beginning that the very reason why John wrote the gospel was that you and I, who are the readers of the gospel, that we would put our faith in Jesus and that because of that, that we would accept this life from him. That's the important thing, not Nicodemus. That, he's 2,000 years ago. You and I are now. Um, and so Jesus is telling us that we have to be uh, up at this level. Okay. So he couldn't even enter the kingdom of God. Now, John has already given us the testimony of John the Baptist back in chapter 1 and verse 33, where he said, The man on whom uh, you see the Spirit rest, he's the one who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So uh, John the Evangelist has uh, prepared you and me, the reader, in order to understand what's being said right now. And this is God's action. And it brings about a relationship between us and God, a relationship of father and son, so that we all become beloved sons. Jesus is the beloved son with capital letters, and we're the beloved sons with the lowercase letters, but we're in his image. OK, St. Paul expressed this very well in Romans 8, 29. Uh, they are the ones that he's chose specially long ago and intended to become true images of himself. A true image is vero icon, a true image, that we would become icons of Jesus. Um, so Nicodemus has another problem, and that is that when you go back 
uh, into the Old Testament. And you'll notice that all the time I'm going back because uh, to understand the Gospels, you have to go back into the foundation, which is in the Old Testament. But there's also a forward uh, look also in the Gospels towards the church and the, the future. So going back, Exodus 4, 23, the whole nation of Israel, they weren't called Israel at the time, the chosen people is a better term for them. Uh, the, the whole group of the chosen people were called the Son of God. This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Now, Israel was the, the, the name given to Jacob. Uh, in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him and I called my son out of Egypt. Now, that was the whole nation. But Nicodemus is hearing that the privileges that were given to the entire nation as a nation before are now being given to each individual. And if you think chapter three is challenging, you go into chapter four and Jesus chooses the most unlikely human being on the planet. And he offers the entire gift to this one individual. God doesn't think the way we do, not at all. So they knew that by meditating on the word of God that they would receive life. But Jesus is talking about something completely different, that this new life is the life of agape love, the life of heaven that we live upon the earth. Okay. Um, so the, the difference between the old covenant, therefore, and the new covenant is the difference between flesh and spirit. Uh, Nicodemus can hear that uh, theoretically, but he's not ready yet to take it on board at all. Uh, a lot of discussion went on among the scholars about him, but they didn't come to any conclusion. But scholars love discussing things anyway. The other thing uh, that we have here, it's in verse 8 that the, the wind uh, or the spirit blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. And that's how it is with all who are born of the spirit. Um, so Jesus, uh, I, I should really say, John, in putting this text here together for us, is telling us uh, that we need to remember that when Jesus speaks about the mysterious coming and going of the Spirit, that we need to remember the mysterious coming of Jesus himself in the incarnation and the even more mysterious going of Jesus in the passion and resurrection. If the incarnation challenge to them, the passion and resurrection is going to challenge them much, much more. And if the Sanhedrin wouldn't accept uh, the mystery of his coming, they're not going to accept the mystery of his going either. Um, and so uh, I'd like to, to just bring in a, a text here from Isaiah, Isaiah 43 verses 18 to 19. Nicodemus needs to accept a bit of advice. And the advice is in Isaiah. And it's this. There's no need to recall the past. There's no need to remember what went before. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Even now it comes to light. Can you not see it? Look, I am making a road in the wilderness and paths in the wilds. Now, John the Baptist already identified himself as the voice in the wilderness of Israel. He's already done that. And he, here uh, is the reminder from Isaiah that if God is coming in an absolutely unprecedented divine visitation, the like of which the world has never known or could never guess, then we have to leave the past and let God do his new thing. God is a creator, so he doesn't patch he creates something completely new. And all Nicodemus hears is that whatever Jesus is talking about, it's completely new. It's not anything like what we had before. And he just said to Jesus in a kind of a lame way, how is that possible? What, where would you start? Uh, is it even available now? So he, he cannot understand this new revelation. Uh, He's not, he's not ready. And he doesn't say to Jesus, look, I don't understand this, but can I have it? You're going to find when you come to chapter four that the Samaritan woman who won't understand 
the living water that Jesus is talking about will say, give me some of that water. When we go into chapter six, the crowds of people uh, in Galilee won't understand where the living bread is coming from, but they will say, give us some of that bread. And because they actually ask for it, Jesus can work the miracle for them. He can't do anything for Nicodemus when Nicodemus doesn't ask. The extraordinary thing is that God has given us a very, very dangerous gift. And it's the gift called free will. We can close somebody out when we want to. We can take somebody in when we want to. We can say yes to a revelation that's given to us. We can say no to a revelation that's given to us. But we have to take the responsibility of our yes or our no. And the, the sadness is that here, uh, you, do, you don't know whether Nicodemus is saying yes or no. He's sitting on the fence, okay? Um, and so Nicodemus had come uh, to Jesus with the heavy ecclesiastical, we know. And so Jesus gives him a, a, an answer which is on the level that he actually understands. And he says, Nicodemus, we also know. And we speak about what we know and what we have seen from above. I'll give you that revelation in our next episode. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach dé liv. Goodbye. God bless you. The work of Shalom is an essential part and a powerful part of the work of evangelization, of promoting the objective of sharing the good news of the gospel, the joy of the good news of the gospel and its promise of salvation in this life and beyond death in the new life of the risen Lord. Its evangelization of culture and civilization is a most important objective for the people of God and the church right around the world. In this 21st century, when the human family is battered by so many forces of change, of uncertainty, forces which seem to threaten and menace hope, the hope of the risen Christ and of the good news of the gospel is something which has to be shared not only between individuals, but with communities of peoples right around the nations of God's earth. May the Lord bestow his blessing on the work of Shalom, on all who are associated with it, and also indeed on all those who through their charity and kindness support its most important work. <laughs>